Hey, welcome to Tape to Tape, powered by Ram Motor Trends, back-to-back -back winner of Truck of the Year. I'm Ryan Dixon, a writer for Sportsnet, and a two-time dad now, as you can maybe see from the sign behind me. And I got fellow zero-time cup winner and two-time dad, NHL editor for Sportsnet, Rory Boylan, with me. I'm making it through, Rory. I got both eyes open. Congrats, man. Hey, you're here and you're awake. You're ahead of the game. It's a win. It's a win. We'll have to. <laughs> and I uh, haven't seen a coffee yet, even. From that's you. right. That's I was going to say, I've seen your monster cup there. I actually <laughs> just dumped the last mouthful of mine out. We're recording 11 a.m. on Friday morning. So I've been slurping it back since uh, about six o'clock. I got to give myself a two hour break and then I'll pick it back up. But we are happy to have our, our little baby boy Sam home and everyone's healthy and doing well. And now we just uh, do the work of going on uh, a little, very little sleep, but uh, a lot of smiles. So we are happy about that and super happy to be talking about the Stanley Cup final, Rory. The Dallas Stars, the Tampa Bay Lightning. First off, we are here. It is happening. We can't forget uh, in this crazy, crazy year, the NHL has made it to the Cup final and no jinx here, but not a single positive test. We all wondered how this was going to go. So off the top, let's just tip our cap to everyone involved, um, everyone who implemented uh, rules and regulations, everyone who followed rules and regulations. Uh, it's great that we are going to see a Stanley Cup final, a September Stanley Cup final in 2020. We are, of course, going to talk about that today. We'll start with the Dallas Stars in the first block, and then we'll talk about Tampa after the break. And of course, make a cup prediction. I think I know which way we're both going to go because we'd be reversing course at this point, which is a major predictions faux pas. But before we get there, let's talk about this Dallas Stars team, which is really a club of... The story of this team is the new guys and the old guys, right? It's Miro Haskinen and Dennis Gurianov with huge offensive contributions. Haskinen announcing himself as one of the very best defensemen in the game. Remember when the Ottawa Senators wanted him in a package for Eric Carlson and the star said, yeah, hard pass, good decision there. And the old guys, Rory, on Dallas, Alexander Radulov, Jamie Benn, Joe Pavelski. Radulov was a healthy scratch in December. Jamie Benn was starting to really get into conversations about worst contract in the NHL. Uh, Joe Pavelski, I mean, you know, I, like many people, felt he certainly had something to give in the playoffs, but it obviously didn't get off to a great start in his first year in Dallas. He's 36 years old yet. Here he is. What do you make of this Stars team that, oh, by the way, maybe the best story going in, longtime assistant coach, uh, Rick Bonus. You know, I heard uh, Elliot and Jeff on the 31 Thoughts podcast talking about it. it's been a, a long time since we've had a coach everyone was pulling for. And Rick Bonus certainly fits that description. Um, just this is a great defensive team that has really found its way offensively. Yeah, it has. I think if, you know, if you're looking for the underdog to root for the good story, Dallas is your team. Probably it's not, not that there's not good stories on Tampa's side, but Dallas is a little bit more of the underdog. Although I don't really fully understand everybody being so shocked that they're here. Like they, they were a good team last year too. And yeah. I think I've said this on the pod before in round two of the 2019 playoffs, they played St. Louis, got to game seven, got to overtime. And there were two really close plays, one by Rope Hints, one by Jamie Ben. I think it was Ben's chance that was a wraparound that went to the goal line and was saved by Colton Pareko. Like they were that close to knocking off the Blues and getting to the conference final. And, you know, maybe they would have been the team to break through last year. They were the third seed in the West after the round robin this year. So they're not like this you know, eight seed underdog that is coming out of nowhere. But it's the way that they got here, I guess, that has been a little bit surprising. They, they have found a way to score goals. That series against Colorado, I mean, Dallas, Dallas probably was the heavy underdog there because I just didn't think that they would be able to keep up with Colorado's offense. And Dallas was actually outscored by one goal in that series and managed to come away with the series win anyway. But that started to prove that Hey, you know what? Maybe if they're forced into a track meet series, they'll be able to keep pace. Yeah, they like to play defense. They completely buy into that system and they will go to full on defense if they have to. But if they're forced to 
take a lot of shots and create a lot of offense. They can do it with Ben and Radulov and Sagan and all these guys that you've talked about. And the fact that Denis Giryanov in his rookie season has just come on like gangbusters. Him and Pavelski lead the team with nine goals. It's been a, a, an absolutely massive development for them. Um, and now they're going to be faced with that same kind of script against Tampa Bay, a team that's going to want to come at them and, 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 and play a fast game and, and not want this series to be too slow. My one question there is, and, and this is the big difference, I think, between Tampa Bay and, and Colorado. There are two big differences between Tampa Bay and Colorado. One, everything that Colorado is, Tampa Bay is just a little bit better. Um, Tampa Bay maybe doesn't have a Nathan McKinnon, but Nikita Kucherov is pretty darn close. And when you pair him with Braden Point, I think that's a better first line. There's more depth down there. When you look at that second line, which it hasn't been that great for Tampa Bay throughout, but it's still a good line with, with Anthony Sorelli leading it down the middle. You got Andre Palat, who's been an overtime hero for them. Tyler Johnson. There's Alex Killen. Like there's a lot of weapons up the front where Colorado was a little bit thinner. I think uh, Victor Hedman is a better lead defenseman and there's more depth on the blue line in Tampa Bay than Colorado had. And the biggest difference is that Tampa Bay has Andre Vasilevsky in net. He's got a 930 save percentage, a GAA below two in these playoffs where Colorado was on to their backup goalie, Pavel Francouz. And that maybe contributed to how Dallas was able to score more goals. Dallas played backup against Calgary as well in Cam Talbot. And so now they're going to be faced with a mostly healthy Tampa Bay team still without Steven Stamkos and they have an ace in net. So it's not just going to be an easy to say, well, Dallas can score. Let's turn it on. Can they do that against an elite net miner? That's going to be put to the test in this. series. Well, if you're the stars, you're saying we did it against Vegas. We did it against uh, Robin Leonard. Um, you know, they, that I think was the big question coming into that series, as you mentioned, coming out of Colorado was, were they going to be able to keep it up against uh, Vegas? And, you know, a, as it turns out, it was a, a five-game series, right? Yeah, a five-game series, a little lower scoring yep. for Dallas compared to the, the Colorado series. And, you know, I, I would actually, if, if this Stanley Cup final series goes the same way as the Western Conference final, I'd be a little worried for the Dallas Stars because they were – thoroughly outplayed in terms of chances if you look at the high danger chances in all situations dallas controlled i think it's 42 percent of them in that series they they less than the new york islanders controlled against the tampa bay lightning uh the vegas golden knights just weren't scoring their shooting percentage in that series was under five peter DeBoer talked about how he thinks the way the vancouver series ended with thatcher demko yeah. just styming them kind of got into vegas players head a little bit and Tampa Bay is not going to have that, that same kind of uh, hangover coming into this series. So if this is going to go the same way, I would be a little concerned. If Tampa is able to get into that middle ice and create a lot of good chances, that's going to put a big strain on Anton Kudobin, who has been great in these playoffs for the most part. But he's been high and low. Like he was high in Vegas, mm -hmm. a little low against Colorado. That had to be a high-scoring series for Dallas to have any chance. So... I think Dallas needs to, Dallas is probably going to lose the shots battle. If they can keep most of those to the outside, they'll have a bit better of a chance, but they have to be able to create a little bit more on their own. Um, they, they can't be out chances they were against Vegas because again, Tampa is just so deep. They're not going to miss if they're given the same opportunities that Vegas was, you know, I, I think that has the recipe for it to be a, a quick series in Tampa's favor. So is there an area you give the nod to Dallas? I mean, when you go up and down the lineup or behind the bench, do you think there's um, one aspect of the game? Maybe it is just on the team defense side of things that you think um, the stars have Tampa even by a nose? Yeah, two things, I think. Um, one is the team defense. If this is going to be a slower series, lower chances, and just it's harder to get to that middle ice, then you start to favor Dallas a little bit more. Then, you know, if these are going to be 2-1, 3-2 games, not too high scoring, I think then Dallas, you, you can start to see a path to how they win this. The other way that they might have an advantage is on that second line, I, I alluded to it. If you look at Tampa Bay's second line, all three of those guys are minus players right now. Um, two of them, uh, Tyler Johnson and Alex Killorn, are two of only three Tampa Bay players 
who are on the ice, or when they're on the ice, Tampa controls less than 50% of the shots at five on five. If you look at Dallas's second line, that's where Giryanov and Pavelski are. And those are the two leading goal scorers again for the Stars. If this is going to be a, a tight, low scoring series, you're going to need some, some clutch goals from time to time. And that just screams Pavelski, doesn't it? Like if, sure. if you're going to need an overtime win or two, or you're going to need the late goal in regulation, Pavelski just seems like the guy who's going to find it for you. You're going to be able to find it for you. So, you know, we, we know Dallas's top line is going to need to bring it. They're going to need to be defensively responsible. They're going to need to be a leader on offense. They're going to need to be able to create some of those goals to keep up with Tampa Bay's top line. But I think where you're going to be able to maybe find a little bit of a difference is if you can keep out playing Tampa's second line, keep them in the minus, and Guryanov and Pavelski can continue the strong playoffs that they had and score some key goals, that's where a, a slight advantage on offense might be found for the Dallas Stars. This has been a playoff unlike any other, so maybe it stands the reason that there's been more off-ice um, news, and not just off-ice news, but news involving teams that have nothing to do with the playoffs than I can ever remember. We've had trades of significance. We've had hirings of significance, and I want to touch on a couple before we flip over to some Tampa talk. Uh, the 2018 Washington Capitals have just never been able to replicate what they had behind the bench in Barry Trotz. Stick tap to Trotz and the Islanders for their final four appearance and pushing Tampa to the overtime in the past uh, two games there. Um, the Caps are obviously still trying to jump through what remains a slightly open window, and they're going to ask Peter Laviolette to help them do that. He has a great resume. He has won a cup. He's been to finals. He's a push the play guy. He's not uh, necessarily the most outwardly chipper guy in the world, but that doesn't mean he's not a good fit for this team. What did you make of Laviolette becoming the next guy for the Capitals? Well, and they paid him. And so my takeaway from that is I, I kind of feel like ownership is acknowledging that maybe they made the mistake of not paying trots mm. uh you know they didn't want to pay up for the coach at the time of course he's the one who won the stanley cup for them and goes on and has success with the islanders so maybe they're acknowledging that okay for this team right now maybe we do need to pay up for the coach because we can't you know we, we need to be as prepared as we can this window with alex ovechkin is getting narrower and they were not really the same team um when they landed in the bubble so you got an experienced guy in Laviolette. Like you said, he can push that pace. He can challenge his players. Um, he talked about, you know, reaching out to Alex Ovechkin after he got the job and basically saying, like, he's coached so many teams around Alex Ovechkin for Ovechkin's entire career. Now they get to work together and see what happens here. And, and so, you know, again, you're just trying to get this team across the finish line one more time, maybe two um, as long as Ovechkin and his core is around here. So you're looking for some experience. It sounded like Mike Babcock was in the running there for a while too. And, and that would have been interesting for a, a number of reasons. Um, but Laviolette's got, you know, a, a, a similar track record of, of success, of, of consistency and stability. Um, I, I see nothing wrong with this hire. I think it's a slam dunk when a team like this goes and does something like this, gets someone proven, you know what you're going to get out of them. And, maybe he's the one that can can push you over the hump again. So Buffalo's new GM, Kevin Adams, has already learned a very important lesson. If you're looking to make a trade, get somebody on the phone who just wants to shake things up, who's willing <laughs> to trade anyone to send a message to the team, because that seems to be the only real logic coming out of the Eric Stahl for Marcus Johansson move. Johansson's a nice player, but I think a lot of people – did a double take honest uh, true story. Maybe this is because I'm on three hours of sleep a night. Elliot Friedman tweeted Johansson for stall. And my first thought was Ryan Johansson for Jordan <laughs> stall. I was like, you know what? I can see it. Nashville had to make a change. Carolina wants a little more offense. It turns out it, uh, it, it played out a little differently than that. I mean, I, I think everyone loves the move for Buffalo Again, you would say it's a head scratcher for the wild, but all the reporting seems to indicate that Garen really wants to shake things up, and and so be it. I mean, it's not like he's trading a 22 year old kid in in Eric Stahl. You know, he's got one year left on his deal, and he maybe he really did uh, send a message to everyone in that room that don't get too comfy in your your spot on the bench. So, um, I mean, I think we have to start with the Buffalo side of things because it was the first real move for 
for Adams. And because one of the subplots when the NHL comes back is officially how happy is Jack Eichel in this uh, horrendous environment? Maybe not even a horrendous environment, just a losing environment where they haven't been able to get it going. And this seems to be something that is going to give the Sabres, you know, give Eichel support on the ice as a, as a solid number two and also off the ice. I mean, Eric Stahl is absolutely on the short list of most respected players around the NHL. And I think it's a, a no doubter for Buffalo to get a guy like that in the room. Yeah. And they drop a, a little over a million dollars in salary cap too. So there's another win for Buffalo there. Um, like, like Stahl is not a point of game player anymore. He's not going to be that kind of Eric Stahl. He had right? the one monster year in Minnesota and then exactly. settled into being kind of 25 goal guy. Exactly. But he's also not end of Carolina, Eric Stahl, New York Rangers, Eric Stahl, yeah. when it looked like, oh man, this guy is a year away from being out of the NHL. Like he's not that. He's in his mid thirties, he's towards the end of his career. He's got the experience. Um, I just think you need to give him what he needs. Like give him players that he can find some chemistry with. Um, you know, Andrew Berkshire did a, a, an analytical breakdown of that trade on sportsnet.ca for us. And, and his major takeaway was, look, he was good in Minnesota with, with Jason Zucker and he was finding chemistry with some guys, Nino Niederreiter, this whole list of players, all of whom the wild traded away by the time that stall was done there. And he was playing with Zach Parise who never once did he ever find solid chemistry with in his time with the wild. So he wasn't really in a position to succeed there in Buffalo. I mean, if you can just find him, those guys, I mean, maybe it's Jeff Skinner even. Like, do you give – those two play yeah. together in Carolina. Like, do you, do you try and find some chemistry there? I don't think it's automatic that Skinner has to be on Jack Eichel's line if it just works better with Eric Stahl. You now have another center that you can um, feel pretty good about, that you can maybe move your lines around and just give yourself a little bit more depth. I don't think you want to go into next season again loading up that first line and then just have Stahl with whoever on the second line and hope he can do it. I think now – kind of like with Edmonton when they split up McDavid and Drysaddle, lesser here in Edmonton, um, but it gives you the option to spread your wingers out a little bit more and give the other team a bit more to deal with on defense. Now you got two lines instead of one super loaded line. Um, it's just finding that support for Eichel. That's all that this is about. Marcus Johansson clearly wasn't the answer there as the number two center. I think they had hoped maybe that Casey Middlestad, who they drafted a couple years ago, would be that guy, and it's just slow going and maybe won't ever happen. They need to figure out that quickly. Buffalo's got to start turning the corner here and making some progress back towards the playoffs or else, you know, get- maybe you start getting into that situation of Eichel asks for a trade or he's just not happy. He's already been uh, – he's already voiced a little frustration here and there. So you got to nip that in the bud, and that – that can't be the end of it, right? Like you've got to address that defense. You've got to figure out some goaltending too. Like there's a lot of work here to do for Buffalo, but the hardest thing a lot of the times is to figure out the middle of the ice. And so now at least, you know, going into next season, you can feel good about your top two centers and now figure out the rest of it around that. If, if Stahl can give you a 50 ish points and find some chemistry with somebody else and not be a defensive liability, that's all that you want out of this trade. And maybe Buffalo can be a little bit better. But again, if we're talking about them being a playoff team next year, this trade alone doesn't really move the needle for me. I want to see what else they can do in this offseason. Well, Buffalo, a city that knows all about sports heartbreak. You know what? When it comes to the Lightning, so do Tampa fans. At least the past half decade or so, it has been quite an up and down run for the Bolts. But they are back in the cup final for the first time since 2015. We are going to talk about the Tampa Bay Lightning, the Eastern Conference champions coming up on the other side of the break on Tape to Tape. Hey, welcome back to Tape to Tape. Don't forget to sign up for the Sportsnet Fantasy Hockey Pool presented by Ram. Just go to sportsnet.ca forward slash ram you can win up to 50k in cash prizes and the grand prize a 2020 ram 1500 or 2500 sportsnet.ca forward slash ram so rory i said the story of the stars was the young and old guys um i feel like the story for big picture big picture for this tampa bay team that i want to talk about and the journey it's been on has been the merging of the high end 
Uber prospects and the unearthed gems. Now, unfortunately, we're not seeing Steven Stamkos in these playoffs. Today is media day for the cup final. The questions are going to be asked. I'm assuming the answers are coming back. Basically, do not expect to see Steven Stamkos in this, Unfit to play. In this series. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> It'd be great if we did. But, yeah. um, but you look at this team built with uh, a perennial, at one point anyways, Rocket Richard challenger, still just an offensive force, a first overall pick in 2008. And your Conn Smythe favorite, the second overall pick, in 2009, Victor Hedman. And, you know, I, I don't have to run down the laundry list of guys that Tampa has found over the years uh, toward, you know, third round and beyond or unsigned guys. But it, it is crazy when you look at the Kucherovs, the, the Palats, the Gords, the Johnsons, uh, just an unbelievable job finding players at a time when, you know, it was one thing for the Detroit Red Wings to unearth uh, guys like Nick Lidstrom in 89 when half the league didn't draft Europeans. Uh, it's another thing to be finding players like this consistently when scouting departments are what they are um, these days. So kudos to the, the Tampa Bay Lightning. I assume at this point, if we, if we did the 2009 redraft, you got Hedman going ahead of Tavares at this point, don't you? Man, that's I don't that's a that's guess, a tough one. I guess it really depends what you want, right? If you're starting uh, you a team, you're, 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 you're coming back next year, just for one year. You go in Hedman or Tavares. Man, that's a tough. That is a really tough choice. I I I, I think it's a conversation. I don't think it's a slam dunk no. either way. Um, I mean, Tavares has been pretty awesome for the Leafs too, and I think that's forgotten sometimes because he's behind Matthews and been a little rocky at times but he was dealing with an injury as well um i'm going I think it's a conversation i think it's tight i think it's really tight well um, i'm going headman because i like my my guy to be able to play 29 minutes in the cup final if i need sure, him to and and that's sure. what's gonna I, happen I, with him right i always lean more towards the center than the defenseman so i might still go with Tavares. but i mean i don't think you're crazy if you go headman either um patience that's yeah. what this team is about right like patience committing to your core and not shying away from them you know there were times where this team could have made significant changes because it just wasn't working they the last time they were in the cup final was 2015 against the blackhawks Which the it, end of one dynasty and the start of maybe another yeah. right um and it didn't really work out that way for the new dynasty tampa uh, you know, they've been to the conference final four of the last six years. There's a playoff miss in there as well. Um, but this is the first time they've been back to the final since 2015. Which seems so crazy. There, I, I, I couldn't, seems when crazy. I thought yes. about it, I was like, yeah, it's been five years. And the interesting thing with Tampa too is it's really been this mix of at times they've shot themselves in the foot or things have just unraveled. And it's been on them more or less. And then there's been other times where they've just been the victim of horrible hockey gods luck. I mean, he, the, the first time this iteration of the team was really good was John Cooper's first full year, 13, 14. And as you may recall, they were, I'm going to say a top three team in the East over a hundred points, you know, already a legit contender and Ben Bishop falls awkwardly on the eve of the playoffs and a nothing game against the Leafs busts his elbow. He was a Vezina candidate that year. I think he finished runner up and they were out in four games because they had backup goalies with 850 save percentages and got swept. And then you said 15, they go to the final. That was a tooth and nail final. You, you always in your mind, the closest finals are always a seven gamers. That was only six, but that was one of those where it was basically a tie game or one goal lead the whole way through that series they that was the the height of the the hawks dynasty and they were right there tooth and nail and then of course the steven stamkos like it happened again this year that he's not going to be able to participate participate in these playoffs he had the blood clot um on the eve of the 16 playoffs and you know that was a huge blow for that team coming back from the cup final trying to get back there and they made the conference final loss in seven games to pittsburgh that year so it's crazy how there's been i mean i guess when you have this narrative of just haven't been able to get it done. Inevitably, it's be because of multiple reasons, but there's just been times where it's been just horrible luck and then times where, you know, they they come out against uh, a, a sneaky, strong Columbus Blue Jackets team last year and 
get up three, nothing in game one, can't bury the fourth goal and things just snowball. They just absolutely yep. snowballed and they're gone in four games. So it's been a wild ride for this franchise. And it's finally coming together. And so, you know, if we, if you didn't learn when Washington won the Stanley cup that, you know, maybe if you know, you've got a talented core that just hasn't won rather than give up on it, maybe just stick with it. Tampa is reminding us of that with this run. I think like there were outs, there were times where they could have said, you know, maybe we do need to make some significant change. Maybe, maybe we should sell high on Kucherov or maybe we should trade out a point or, you know, not bring back Steven Stamkos when he was a free agent or, or there, there were times when they could have said, you know what, this core is just not working. So if you're a fan of the Toronto Maple Leafs or maybe a little bit lesser, the Calgary Flames, and you're just sitting there and you're looking at your top skill players and they haven't got over the hump and you're just ready to kind of give up on them. Maybe just take a deep breath, step back and watch this Tampa Bay team and just Take, your takeaway should be let's just stick with this core. Eventually they'll break through because it, they, you know, the most recent time Tampa could have started to give up a little bit on everybody in this core was last year when they got swept by Columbus. Like you said, they, they could have Even addressed just, that just out of rage, just making rage trades. Exactly. At that point. A trade for the sake of trade. Yeah. Like Bill Guerin yeah. was just talking about with the Minnesota wild. Uh, but instead, you know, Julian Breezebois, added subtleties around he added some some strength in pat maroon he added a little sandpaper and offensive upside of the trade deadline in in blake coleman barclay goodrow another kind of physical guy right um that's maybe what they were missing and this is why breezeball was a finalist for gm of the year it's not about making the grand changes all the time that gets you over the hump it's 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 addressing the the more subtle needs that your team has to get over the hump. And so far he's been proven right that all of those things have worked out splendidly uh, for the Tampa Bay lightning. So maybe that's what fans of Toronto and Calgary and some of these other disappointed teams should, should fall back on. Let's try and make those smaller moves and try and come back better next year because it's worked so well for Tampa Bay. You know, they're going to need to get the best performances from their big guys. We know that, but they're going to need those depth guys to come through as they have all these playoffs. And I think this playoff too has really shown that they have leveled up. You know, they've been able to fight through adversity right away. Round one, you meet Columbus, the team that beat you out last year, and you're faced with a five overtime August epic right out of the gate. I mean, you lose that yeah. and you're exhausted going into game two and who knows, but they're able to win it. And all of those games were really, really close. The only game that was won by more than uh, one goal was Columbus's only win. But it was a short five-game series uh, that Tampa was able to go through and, and, and fight through. And that showed something. And then in round two, who do you draw? But the, the Boston Bruins, another team that, you, you know, you've got to prove yourself. You've got to be able to beat this, this playoff-proven team. And Tampa Bay dropped game one of that series 3-2. Game two went to overtime. I mean, it's very realistic that the Lightning are down 2-0 in that series, and maybe we're talking about Boston or some other team right now, but they were able to win game two in overtime, and then game three and four, they won by a combined 10-2 to score, and that was basically the end of it. Like, they didn't let Boston back into that series at all. The 7-1 win was absolutely devastating for the Bruins. Um, so, again, they showed playoff medal. They showed something different this year. They were over to, able to overcome adversity and push through. And against the New York Islanders, I mean, they were up three games to one in that series as well. It, was, it wasn't as close as some of the other ones. Game one was just slam dunk win. Uh, the Islanders were obviously tired on short rest. Tampa came in with almost a week off, I think it was, and they blew the doors off. And so a huge advantage right away. The Islanders pushed Tampa Bay, but it never really felt like they were a threat to win that series. Tampa Bay was in control most of the way, and, and they came through with the win. A little bit of a, a, a scare with the game five loss in overtime and another game that goes to overtime in game six but again a clutch goal they get through and I don't know what more that you would want to see on this team like a lot of a lot of adversity they fought through they did it they got through these series pretty quickly too so mm -hmm. they'll get here a little bit more rested than than Dallas is even though Dallas's conference final was a little bit quicker but they're just they seem so primed to finally get over that hump and win the Stanley Cup this year with this group. Yeah, I just feel like in past years when Brock Nelson gets a shorthanded breakaway in overtime as he did 
in game six. Like that's the one that goes in on Tampa. When Vasilevsky makes yes. that save, you know, you do start to wonder if things feel different. I, is the biggest question right now for Tampa just how healthy Braden Point is? I mean, he's back and that's great news. Um, but I think we can safely say he won't be at 100%. Is that what you'll be watching most closely for this team going into this series? Yeah, I wrote the um, Stanley Cup final preview on .ca, and Braden Point is the X factor. I generally don't like to make the big headline guys the X factor in those things because, of course, they've got to perform, right? But in this case, it's, it, it is Point because, I mean, what is he? How healthy is he? He missed two games in that Islanders series, and those are the two games Tampa Bay lost. I think they've won nine of the last 11 games he's actually been in the lineup for them. So they're basically almost unstoppable as long as he's playing. But now you're on short rest two day or one, one off day between your last game and game one of the Stanley cup final to rest up. Is he ready? Is he going to be on, on top of his game? I, I think you can at least step back and look at game six against the Islanders and say, okay, point played 25 plus minutes. He recorded four shots. He recorded four block shots. He didn't seem like they were protecting him from anything, mm -hmm. and he seemed like he was fine. So that's certainly a good a, a good sign for things to come. But again, this could be a a just tough physical series where it's it's not easy to create the offense. You got to fight through a lot of Dallas's traffic. And you know if he's if he was game six against the Islanders, that doesn't automatically mean he's going to be fine in game one or game four against against Dallas. Is he going to be able to keep it going at a high level throughout this entire Stanley Cup final? Without him, Tampa Bay just isn't quite the same team. They don't have the same depth down the middle. They don't have the same offensive ceiling as they have with him in the lineup. So as long as he's there and he is in tip-top shape, hard to see how they are going to lose this series, but the door certainly opens if he's not able to be the Braden Point we all expect. Yeah, everyone, of course, held their breath when the second line center, the new second line center with Stam goes out, Anthony Sorelli uh, collided with Honors Lee. I think it was a uh, fluky play toward the end of the second period in game six. But obviously, Sorelli, okay, came back, scored the kind of Patrick Kane-esque uh, overtime yeah. winner yeah. where we had the, uh, is it, uh, yeah, oh, they're in, it's in, they're, they're in the final. Congratulations, Tampa Bay. Uh, Sorelli, of course, just uh, yet another in a seemingly endless series of great finds good stories and development stories for this team there's no question we're both picking tampa because that's who we were picking from the start the only question is are we both going to wimp out and give the bland six game just enough respect to dallas or have you got it happening quicker than that or do you have it happening longer than that and really think dallas is going to give tampa a serious shake I love Dallas. I don't want to disrespect the Dallas Stars. I think there's a lot to love about this team. Um, but I just think this is a bad matchup. If if Point is healthy, I think this is just a bad matchup for them. They're not going to be able to take advantage of the same things they were on some of their other opponents. Tampa doesn't have any weakness, it doesn't seem, if as long as everybody who has been in the lineup is still there. I'm going with Tampa Bay in five games, and this thing is over in a week. Oh, I was going to say five games, too, just to <laughs> sort of make a, a statement. And, and it, what it really does just come down to is, you're right, it just feels like it's finally Tampa's time. They, they really just are rolling. They're finding themselves on the good side of the monumental moments rather than the devastating side. And, um, yeah, they just they have a cookie. I mean, they they only get a day off, but they don't have to travel anywhere. Uh, you could make an argument for game one anyways. It's nice to be in that rhythm. And as you said, I mean, the there was the old uh, Scotty Bowman adage that probably doesn't apply to the, the parody era of hockey, but he always wanted his teams to get through the first two rounds in no more than 10 games so that you still had something in the tank for the final two. And Tampa actually did that. I, I'm guessing most cup champions don't really do that these days. It's probably more like a couple six gamers or a five and a six in the first round, but yeah, 10 games to get through Columbus and Boston and, and six more for, I mean, I guess it was more like six games against Columbus when you consider the, the five yeah. OT, but, yeah. but they should be, you know, they they're in rhythm. And like you said, if point is healthy. Um, yeah. I, I like Tampa's odds of, uh, of winning this cup in five. Yeah. I mean, they just, what, what is Tampa's weakness? If, if point is playing, I just don't see a way through for Dallas. It's not going to be easy for them to create offense. Tampa is still going to be able to create and they're shooting against a backup goalie who, you know, Kadobin has been great, but mm -hmm. he hasn't seen a team like Tampa Bay yet. 
All right. Well, our plan is to jump in mid series. We're going to, we're going to pop in after game three, game three is Wednesday night. So we're going to fire up the microphones on uh, Thursday before probably games four and five. We'll see. We're both saying five. So we think we're going to get um, that's a back to back actually next Friday, Saturday, but once again, just great to, to be here, to have a cup final starting on Saturday night, hockey night in Canada in September. Um, very exciting. Um, great being here with you as always, pal. Everyone check out Rory's preview of the final on sportsnet.ca. Follow Rory on Twitter at Rory Boylan. Thanks to Mike and Michael, the men behind the scenes here. And check back next week for more Glass Rattlin' hockey action on Tape to Tape.